All right, friends, it's time to give you loyal listeners a discount on protein powder. You may or may not know, but I launched my very first protein powder two years ago. It's a grass-fed beef isolate with only three ingredients, grass-fed beef, either organic cacao or organic vanilla, and organic monk fruit. Now, if you don't want any of the added flavor and sweeteners, you can also just get unflavored. And no matter what flavor you choose, you're getting over 23 grams of protein per scoop, which is gonna keep you full and satisfied between meals. I love starting my day with a Fab Four smoothie and breaking my fast with that much protein. It makes a serious difference in my cravings and blood sugar balance the rest of the day, and I've seen it with my clients as well. Now, I never thought I'd own a product company, but when I got pregnant with Sebastian, I realized the majority of protein powders were chemically extracted or enzymatically extracted, and I wanted to use heat and water only. I wanted minimal ingredients because we don't need those emulsifiers, fillers, or added vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. All of those additions increase the chances that it's not gonna work for your body, whether it be bloating, digestion issues. I just wanted pure clean protein to keep you full and satisfied so you could build the most delicious Fab Four smoothie. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the flavor. If you take a look at our reviews on Amazon, you'll see five-star reviews for flavor. And that is key because if you don't love your Fab Four smoothie and you don't love drinking your protein powder, you're not gonna do it. It won't become a habit and it's consistency that outpaces everything. So. If you're here and you're listening and you want to give our protein powder a try, use the code PODCAST5 for $5 off your order. And let me know if you love it. My favorite ways to apply this protein powder is in my Fab Four smoothie, making freezer fudge, making chocolate milk, making hot chocolate, and throwing the unflavored into all my kids' baked goods. So let me know how you use it. Let me know if you love it. And share this podcast deal with your friends. Snodgrass is a food lover, health enthusiast, and the founder of the popular blog and social media outlet, The Defined Dish. She is a recipe developer and food stylist from Dallas, where she lives with her husband and two young daughters. She is a master at substituting clean ingredients to create bold flavors in the kitchen, and her recipes are perfect for any level of home cook. In 2018, Alex won the most inspired weeknight dinners from Savora Blog Award, and she continues to share her love for creating special moments around the dinner table. She just released her second cookbook, the instant New York Times bestseller, The Comfortable Kitchen, 105 laid back, healthy and wholesome recipes. Alex is a down to earth mama, and I am so excited to welcome her to the Be Well by Kelly podcast. Let's learn how to get back in the kitchen. Alex, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Congrats on your new book, The Comfortable Kitchen. And I love it. It's beautiful and everything looks delicious. Oh, thank you. It's a labor of love for sure, but I'm really excited that it's finally out into the world. <laughs> Definitely. Well, can we, can you like take us back? I mean, I don't know that I know your whole story. I've been following along with the Defined Dish for a long time on Instagram, but I'm just curious, like, when you first fell in love with food and, and how you started cooking for your family and how it's evolved. For sure. I feel like I fell in love with cooking since like I was in the kitchen with my mom. I grew up in a town called Salina. It's just north of Dallas. It's a smaller town. And we just didn't have a ton of restaurants where I grew up. We would have to like get in the car and drive at least 40 minutes to go eat. And so meals were just our norm. And so I just grew up taking an interest in being a part of it, like really young. I mean, I feel like my earliest memories were in the kitchen with either my grandmother or my mom. And I always really loved food and loved having advice in the kitchen. And I feel like once I got to college and then all of a sudden eating out became the norm, was like, this is just so much work to go out to eat all the time and figure out where to go and all these things. And I miss just the simple act of just like being at home and having home cooked dinner. So as soon as I got into my first apartment after the dorms, the dorm series, I just really, that's when I really fell in love myself with cooking and creating. I would call my mom and ask her, okay, I know I've watched you make this a million times. Like, how can I make this by myself? And that kind of I went from like learning my mom's basics to kind of tweaking them and doing my own things with them to really discovering my love for cooking. And then of course, like watching Food Network all the time and just like my sophomore year was really whenever it kicked off and my love for cooking just 
overtook. And then from there, after college, I just kept doing it. I was always like that roommate during college and after that was just cooking for my friends and, and all my family all the time. And fast forward, I had um, my first daughter at 24. She was a surprise. And I, you know, loved cooking. And then we, I ended up starting a blog on the side just because I, I thought it would be fun to share as a hobby. And I quickly realized it was a huge passion of mine to share my recipes with the people. So that's the really long story short. I could keep going for days, but any specifics I could answer. <laughs> yeah, no. I, well, I'm curious what your mom's like favorite recipes were that you were learning to cook like for yourself. Like what were some of those favorites? Yeah. And will we find, do we see any of those modified yes. your way on your blog and in your books? Yes, some modified, some not. So just depending on the recipe, like she is half Italian. So she has a lot of that in her style of cooking. We had a lot of pasta growing up. And so a lot of the recipes that I feel like that I've shared that come from my mom are her Italian ones, because that's what she did best. And so and she did a lot of fish as well. But I'd say her Italian food re has really made its way into both of my books. The first one, like, I have my uh, grandma's celery soup, which was a staple in our household and just like a good classic meatball recipe. In the second book, her anchovy pasta is really made true to how she made it. And that one's a, a really good pantry staple when you have nothing in your fridge that's fresh to make. So I love that one as well. So yeah, a lot of her Italian cooking has made its way. And then of course, like my grandmother on my dad's side has that like Southern root style cooking that involves getting out every can of food and mixing it together and throwing it in the oven. Mm -hmm. So I've had a lot of fun taking those. I have all of my grandmother's recipe cards. My aunt gave them to me because she knew I would put them to good use. And I've had a lot of fun of taking a lot of those old school casseroles and making them better for you. Yeah. Instead of using the can of mushroom soup or cream yeah. of mushroom soup, cream of uh, cream of chicken soup, I love to like all the tables like I know just, like so a tub good. of mayo, some cheddar cheese, <laughs> some cream of mushroom or chicken soup, literally and, everything just yeah. compiled into one dish. <laughs> so, what so. are some of your favorite casseroles that you've created? So, in the new book, I have a Texas tamale pie which is not tamale at all, but usually it's like wolf brand chili at the bottom topped with like a box of cornbread and then you put it in the oven and then you bake it. Yeah. So I did like a homemade, you know, sauce base at the bottom and then did a grain-free kind of cornbread topping on it and throw that in the oven and it's really good. It's paleo friendly and it's so delicious. That sounds so that's, like... That's one off the top of my head. But right yeah, there's, my alley. there's plenty more, but that's one that's in the new book that comes to mind. So you mentioned paleo, how, I mean, how has your eating changed over time and have you ever per, like subscribed to a diet or a lifestyle or changing what you're eating based on your health? Yes. Yeah, so I would say after I had my first and I feel like, you know, I had her younger than I anticipated and we had packed up our lives in Austin and moved back to Dallas. And my husband and I were just kind of like, we hadn't even really started our careers yet. So we were still in that stage of like, who are we? What are we going to do for the rest of our lives? And I started to really struggle with anxiety and it was a mixture of like postpartum anxiety mixed in with what am I doing with my life? And I had never had that before. And I was really struggling. And my sister was a personal trainer at the time. And she had done a whole, because she just, you know, a lot of people were talking about it. She wanted to try it. And so she had recommended I do that because she was just like, I had a really good mental clarity. I feel like if you don't have that glass of wine at the end of the day and you just like clean up your diet for a month, then you'll have some better relationships with food and like just what you're picking to eat at the end of the day. And I think you'll find some mental clarity from it. And at that point I was like, you know what, I'm willing to try anything. And so I did it. And just like she said, I, I found it to be a really good ripple effect to me and just an introduction to some of the ways that I cook now. I obviously don't fully subscribe to eating Whole30 365 days a year, yeah. but I do think that it helped me just realize that like taking the time to meal prep and go to the grocery store and really think about what I'm going to cook throughout the week is so important. And then that turned into me not being hungover and not feeling low energy and I was working out more and I, just like 
it was just that 30 days of just really focusing in and honing, honing in on myself is really what I needed because I felt like I was, you know, as a new mom, you will do everything for everybody and you forget to take care of yourself. So many, so many people do, do that. And I found myself in that place and doing that whole 30 was the, the nudge that I needed to be like, wow, whenever I take care of myself and put my priorities first, I can prioritize everybody else as well. And so it was just the perfect ripple effect for me. And it really changed uh, my pantry staples and my kitchen and just how I cook. I still feel like I get to eat all the things that I love, like Texas tamale pie and <laughs> pastas and all the things. I'm just more cautious about the ingredients I buy. I look at labels and I'm like, okay, this has a lot of things that I would rather not put into my body. So I'm not going to use that. And of course, sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes it's not in my opinion, but it's definitely changed my eating habits drastically. That one, that one whole 30, so many years ago. So I think that's why I have that, that paleo focus, just because whole 30 and paleo go so hand in hand. Right. And you can, I mean, I've seen it through your recipes, just like you said, the te Texas tamale pie, just being, just having these other options that hit the spot when you want that like home cooked hearty comfort food but you can have that same experience with less ingredients or more whole based ingredients i think it's interesting i've seen a lot of people do either something like whole 30 or the clean program or you know like pick a whole food based sort of diet change but what comes out of it when it ripples into the rest of their life is really that they felt better that they felt yeah. more confident, that they felt like really proud of themselves, that they could follow through for themselves, that they could kind of check the box and feel good eating their little homemade replacements of the things that they loved. Like mm -hmm. that's that's definitely where it, where it's at. And I'm I'm so glad that you did that whole thirty because what you've created are all these really easy, amazing recipes. You won the most inspired weeknight dinners dinners award from Savor. Right? Is that yes. it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, every time I say it, I say it differently because I know I'm butchering it. I think yeah. it's a war, but yeah. either way. Yeah. It's, it's amazing because that's the kind of, those are the meals that we replace with takeout when we've had a long weeknight or, you know, long weekday or work day and we're like overwhelmed and we have our kids. And so I kind of want to get in your brain. I want to be you because you seem to have it all together when it comes to cooking for your family and even I, I Instagramming <laughs> it. Like if I get something yeah. from my family, like 90% of the time, it's not ending up on my Instagram because I'm just like, now we're eating. <laughs> yeah. But you do a really good job of sharing. Can you walk me through how you think about your entire week from meal prep to your grocery store, to how you store your, your food and, um, hacks that our listeners can take home and how they may start to apply your tips to their life. Yeah. You know, it's kind of tricky because I'm also recipe developing a lot of the time. So we'll just put that aside and we'll say like a normal week whenever I'm not recipe developing like anything crazy like a cookbook. I usually like to go on a Monday because I have that flexibility and I'll kind of map out my dinners first and I'll, I really like to diversify what protein that we eat. I feel like that's how I keep it fresh. So I'm like, okay, on Monday we'll have salmon. On Tuesday, I'm like wanting some red meat. So we'll do some steak tacos. So like this week, for example, what I did was I was like, all right, Monday we're going to do salmon bowls. Tuesday, we're going to do steak taco night. And usually my husband and I will either have them in lettuce cups or sometimes not just depending on our mood. And my kids will do the tortillas. And then I bought some chicken for Wednesday night. I was going to do a skillet like chicken dinner. And then I feel like depending on the week, what social, you know, sports and anything else that we have, that's where it kind of gets fuzzy and I'll have stuff in the freezer where I can throw together an easy dinner or we'll go grab something. But I at least get three to four dinners and I kind of diversify and keep it exciting by my protein and get that down. And then I usually will prep some sort of grab and go breakfast element for my husband and I, just because... He's always running out the door in the mornings and, and then I like to eat after I work out when everyone's out of the house and otherwise I'm just making all these different meals if I try to make my kids breakfast day myself. So I'll make like an egg bite or something of that nature for the beginning of the week. And lunches usually consist of me making some sort of random salad and with everything. I usually get extra vegetables and, and uh, greens and all, you know, 
throw together something of that of that nature for lunch or like a can of tuna, I'll make a tuna salad and put that together as well. So th that's usually where I get pretty scrappy is my lunch, but have a lot of fun and get creative as well. <laughs> So I love a kitchen. It's like throwing everything but the kitchen sink when it comes to like the veggies that are in your fridge. And are you, to keep things fast and efficient, are you like, I call it meal prep light, but are you doing any type of like washing and chopping or like how, what does your fridge look like? Like when you open it, like what's pre-prepared? It sounds like you have your egg bites. Is there anything else that's pre-prepared for you or, um, or like mise en place, if you will? Yeah, I so I will do a little bit of that up of that, but I don't take a lot of time doing that, to be honest, just because I am working from home and I have the time to do it. And it is kind of like what I do for a living too. So I don't, I don't go overboard with doing that. But if I make like a batch of soup for lunches or like a tuna salad for lunches, I'll chop up some like carrots and, and just carrot sticks so that I can use that for scooping. But I usually get home, I wash my vegetables. So that's done for the most part, unless it's like a more delicate and fragile like I wash my fruit as I go and I wash like my lettuce as I go so it doesn't yeah. get soggy it goes bad um, so yeah fast. it goes bad so fast so I'll usually wash all the other things that I can just get out and chop up real quickly and then I usually will rinse all my herbs and I put them almost like a flower bouquet in a jar with a little bit of water on the bottom mm -hmm. and put those in the fridge so that those are easy to throw on top of all the things and add you know, the fresher flavor that we all love. So I do a little bit. I mean, I definitely take the time each week, like yesterday, because I have been traveling. Yesterday I got home and did my big food haul. And I grabbed, I before I even went to the grocery store, I went through my refrigerators and I have a bunch of fridge drawers. That's how I operate. And clean them out. I see what I have. And I usually like get my vacuum out. It's the biggest trick you vacuum out all the, the nasty this clean out the refrigerator. And then that way, when I get home from the grocery store, I know what I already had. I put everything in place and I like to keep everything very organized. That is important to me. I try not to let a lot of stuff go bad every week. Yeah, that's key. Yeah. I mean, if something's in the back and it hasn't been washed and it's in still in the green bag from the grocery store, you're like, wait, what was so that? Gross. I know. And so I think taking the time, because when you get home from the grocery store and you have all the bags ready to unload, and then you also have to clean out your fridge, I think it's really overwhelming. So if it's, you can get that task done, I feel like it only takes 15 minutes. It always seems like it's going to take longer to clean out your refrigerator. If you just take that 15 minutes, make sure nothing's expired, clean out, get all the old stuff out and just see what you have. You can also be like, oh, I have asparagus. I can do uh, grilled chicken and asparagus tonight for dinner and have at least one meal plan and not let that asparagus go to waste. So I do think that that's one of my best tricks is cleaning out the fridge before I go to the grocery store. <laughs> Definitely. Clean out your fridge and the uh, herb bouquet. I love that. Yes, it is great. In, in the front of, because that's another thing that like, even if it's clean and washed, but in the back of the fridge, you may be like, we made tacos and I didn't even like pull off the cilantro because you can't. Oh yeah. I would never forget that. <laughs> no, I wouldn't either. But all the people who think it tastes like soap are like, that's not even in my fridge. So let's talk about those grab and go breakfasts, egg bites, like little egg scramble cups. And what else yep. are you making for, for grab and go breakfast? What are some of your favorite? Well, right breakfasts? now I've been trying to, I've been trying to recreate the sous vide egg bites that Starbucks makes. Mm -hmm. And it has been a mission and I'm really close and that's in my fridge right now. And they are the best best thing I've had for to grab and go breakfast, but I'll be sharing that on the blog soon. I'm trying to think other things that I make. You know, if I make a hash at the beginning of the week, that's a really good grab and go breakfast. I'll like ground up some grass fed beef with some sweet potato and put like a hard boiled egg on it or a jammy egg, I'm really into jammy eggs, things like that. Or I usually keep smoked salmon in the fridge as well. So I can quickly make some avocado toast and put salmon on top of that. If I need like a quick it's not really grab and go, but a quick make and couple minutes eat and run. Yes, you know. For so your jammy those are eggs, usually my go -tos. Yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. For your jammy eggs, are you making those ahead of time or is it something? Yes, that... and they're really good cold. Tell me about this. So you just follow <laughs> like because I I definitely I, will make a hard boiled egg. I said a hard boiled so egg. So I do six fridge. and a half. I do six and a half minutes on okay. the dot. I'll and put so put them into an ice bath let them right. cool. And then I put them into the refrigerator, just still with the shell on it. My wheels are spinning. I have to go back. Are you putting it in cold water and bringing it to a boil and no. then starting okay. your clock? 
I is, is the water boiling? <laughs> Sorry. I, you know, there's I like 35,000 recipes for jammy eggs on, there are. on the I internet. Bring the water, I bring the water to a boil. I yeah. lower them down with like a slotted spoon or a spider that you yeah. call them. I lower them down. I let them boil for exactly six and a half minutes. Okay. And then I lift them back up. I put them in the ice bath, let them cool. And then I literally put them in the fridge. I'll just like get a Sharpie and put like a little dot on the top of the eggs that are cooked. Yeah. <laughs> and I know which one, so I can grab those and put them on top of toast. Or sometimes I'll just put them on greens with some smoked salmon and have a quick breakfast with a jammy egg on top. And oh. the, the jammy egg center is good when it's, you know, warm after you, they're fresh obviously like that's best but it's still good when it's kind of chilled it almost gets even jammier yeah. in the fridge like so it's cheesy. really good yeah yum <laughs> it's great and i also have to say that you're protecting all those like heat sensitive antioxidants like lutein and zeaxanthine by using jammy eggs instead of hard boiled because the minute that yolk is hard they're degraded so oh. Well, major brownie points for that. That's why, I needed, from you. <laughs> that's why I needed to know exactly how to make it. Um, that's exactly why I've been doing it that way. I'm just kidding. I know. I know. You know that. You're just, you got this. That is amazing. Okay, cool. And so how long do those last? When you make hard boiled eggs or jammy eggs, how long do you keep them in your fridge? I usually, I'm kind of weird with eggs. I'm like, it's like a three day thing for me. Yeah. I don't yeah. usually go more than that. Oh, gosh. So. So funny because my husband the, uh, last night was like, hey, uh, is this pesto? Like, it? how long does it last? And we we were joking because he has a friend from college. I'm like, well, if it was your friend, Chris, it'd be 30 days. If it was you, because he's like you, I'm like, mm, three to five days. <laughs> yeah, know? three to five is my out. mark. With, with <laughs> eggs, I feel like three days is my mark. And then I'm kind of like, mm, I don't know about this anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. So that was a great one. Are there any other recipes like that that you're just like, I have this in the back of my, this is in my repertoire. I know it by heart. I make it all the time. Like, what are those recipes for you and your family? Oh gosh, I have a bajillion. <laughs> well, that's good because that's, you know, like you're, if you have a, if you only know how to make three things, they, you just repeat those three things over and over and over again. Yeah. And I feel like we don't do a lot of repeating in our house just because I mean, I'm just constantly, my wheels are turning around food and dinner time. And it's why I do what I do is because I love food so much. And like, I just don't eat a dull meal, meal ever. I'm just all about the pizzazz when it comes to eating. I need to be excited. But I feel like keeping like, like today for lunch, for example, I had a lot of greens, but I didn't have enough protein. So I like keep sausage in the freezer so that I can, I had a sausage salad for <laughs> really sexy but delicious hey you know <laughs> that happens but now I'm curious like if it's frozen what are you doing to defrost it quickly and cook it up fast I'll just set it on the counter like when I get home from workout I'll be like okay hopefully in a couple hours it'll be you'll be good to go. okay so <laughs> yeah. there is some you know it's there really in the over here. yes but I feel like so I have like my easy go-to dinners which on my blog I have literally a category it's called five ingredient meals where I'll grab a grab I'll grab a bag of green beans and some ground turkey and then I'll kind of add some Asian flavors to it and then throw in some Thai basil and it's just such a good stir fry that's so easy and it's just five ingredients yeah. so I'll do stuff like that for my family that's really great whenever you just like don't want to think about it and you can do that all week long and create these great dinners up out of something so simple out of like, you know, the package of green beans and, a, and a, a thing of ground turkey, or, you know, sometimes I'll grab a jar of hatch green chilies and I'll chop up chicken and I'll make a, like a chicken green chili stew. That's one that's on the blog too. So these like five ingredient meals, you could literally meal prep around that and just be like, Hey, on Monday, I'm doing a turkey stir fry on Tuesday. I'm making a chicken stew and have these five ingredient meals that are still really delicious and impressive. And I did a series a while ago and I really focused on that for a while to show people that like dinner time can still be really good and really easy. And, um, you can take off so much stress by keeping those ingredient dinners in your back pocket, which for a recipe creator like me, it's not as fun to share those types of recipes. Cause I'm like, oh, I have all these ideas or I want to like you know, make my own sauce and then I want to marinate the chicken and then I want to grill the chicken. Then I want to add the sauce and then I'll put the, then I want to make the salad to go over. And it's a lot of elements that are still simple, but together it can cause a lot of stress. 
So those meals are a really good reminder to people that like not every meal has to have every element homemade and so stress stressful. <laughs> Oh, I like, I'm so inspired by you because I would just, I, I am a home cook. I'm playing around in your five ingredient meals all day, every day, <laughs> but it's in that type of cooking that makes it feel like, oh, I could do that marinade and throw it on my chicken and use it as a sauce and throw the salad on top. Like yeah, you, it's almost like training wheels. Like you get used to cooking in your kitchen, you get used to using everything in your fridge and, and then you feel inspired and like confident to exactly graduate. it's the confidence building yes when people are really new in the kitchen and they're like how do i start i'm like pick three days a week maybe that's too much for you maybe it's two days a week right. that you cook for yourself and keep it really simple it doesn't have to be you don't have to be martha stewart every night whenever you do decide to cook you can do these ingredient dinners and that will build your confidence and being like wow this is really easy and then they'll start to create ideas on their own of these ingredient meals. Like Trader Joe's is like the ultimate inspiration for ingredient dinners. I mean, there's just so many different dried condiments that are delicious and you can grab a protein and like put together in a vegetable and put together a delicious meal in no time. So I think it's a really good way to get people started in the kitchen. It's been like this category, five ingredient dinners is perfect for you. Get started there, get some confidence, get your days of the week down that you like to cook and then you're going to feel comfortable enough to move on to the next to the next category or add some days to the week that you are cooking for yourself and soon enough you'll be cooking five nights a week <laughs> there you go so you mentioned trader joe's what are some of your favorite condiments or condiment style ingredient meals i feel like oh man i like so many i love some of my favorite condiments are green curry paste okay same. That's we one of my favorites. Curry last night. It's so easy. You're like, how so you easy? All this stuff for me here. It's just like so crazy. flavorful. I mean, that's one of the most flavorful, like condensed flavor products that you can buy. So green curry paste is definitely on the top of my list. In my book, I have like a green curry poached halibut. That's really good. And then it gets kind of brothy. So then when you spoon that over the rice, it's just so good. Delicious. And then I also have like a green curry cauliflower soup. That's really good too. Those have been really popular. I feel like at Trader Joe's, I love grabbing their cashew kale pesto. Okay, That's really good. I'll put it in a frittata and make that for like a meal prep for the week. But then I'll also grab like a Siete Foods tortilla, warm that up, do a swipe of pesto, some, tur some fresh turkey slices and some alfalfa sprouts and avocado, roll that up and have lunch like wraps to ready to go so i feel like you know you have that thing and it's open like use it think about the ways that you can incorporate it into like a sandwich or a wrap or your dinner you can literally put it on your chicken or even add a spoonful of it to chicken noodle soup and have pesto chicken noodle soup like the possibilities with condiments store-bought condiments are truly endless mm -hmm. i mean they're they're there for a reason. And I think some people are just like, oh, I'll just put it on my grilled chicken and I'll have a side of broccoli. It's like, no, you can go, you can get really crafty with it. <laughs> I love it. Well, what are some of your favorite condiments to keep around, even if you make them or buy them that you think are versatile, like, like green curry and kale pesto? I love in my new book, the Chipotle dressing. It's in one of the salads. It's just like a chopped chipotle salad, but that dressing is so good. It's kind of like the pesto. You can put it on it. You can put a swipe of it on anything and it just takes it up a notch. Keeping stuff like that around for the week to toss together a salad is, is what, that's one of my favorites. What are my, some of my other favorites that I turn to a lot? I mean, I feel like having a jar of coconut aminos and a jar of fish sauce to make a good stir fry in night of the week are really good. I'm really into the, like a chili oil. I make the walks of life chili oil all the time. I also like the Fly by G brand that you can buy with the Szechuan. I think Trader Joe's has the Szechuan chili crisp as well. Yeah, It's all kind of like a similar flavor profile, but adding that to stir fries, so good and spicy. I love spicy food. So those are some off the top of my head. Well, let's dive into your new book. The Comfortable Kitchen. What are some of your favorite recipes there that you think are a great starting place? And where would you send people after they've gotten their confidence in the kitchen? Okay, so one that I feel like, uh, a few that I feel like are the favorite and some of my favorites too. We all like the same things. There is a easy chicken, like Dan Dan inspired noodles. 
in the pasta section and it's really good and you're going to feel like you are a chef for sure when you make that one. That one's really fun. I also really like the salmon fish taco bowls in the salad chapter. That's a favorite. And the chicken milanese, the crispy chicken milanese is really easy to make and really delicious. It was something that I used to make all the time whenever Clayton and I were dating and like he would come over for dinner, I would make that because it's like kind of impressive, but it's, it's really simple. What is And, that? um, what, it's what just like it? a breaded chicken cutlet and okay. then it has like an arugula salad on top. It's what are you delicious. using? What are you using for your breading? And um... I use gluten-free panko breadcrumbs. Okay. And it's, I think the way that you say, I'm probably butchering this brand's name, Aliyah. Okay. A-L-E-I-A. Okay. Aliyah, Alia. not sure. Tomato, okay. tomato. Yeah, tomato, tomato. We <laughs> I got tend you. to butcher everything <laughs> that I pronounce. I'm the worst at pronouncing things. One of my favorites. And you dredge, I, before I dredge it, I dip it in not just the egg wash. I add a lot of Dijon to it. So it really amps up the flavor of the chicken. Yeah. Simple and delicious. And those are some really good starters for someone that's kind of like new to my recipes and kind of wants to get the hang of things. Oh, and the paleo lemon chicken. Okay. That will be next phase. Once you get your confidence, the paleo lemon chicken is so good. It's, it's easy to make, but it's a little bit cumbersome because each piece of chicken, you have to roll in tapioca flour. Okay. So it just ends up taking a little bit more time than you think. It's like very, it's a very easy task, but it's kind of annoying. But the end result of that one is fantastic. It's like a really tangy Asian inspired stir fry that my whole family is obsessed with. Talk me through yeah. how you make that one. Like what's, you mentioned tapioca starch. Is that the flour, flour or, or like so, drying yes. so, agent of choice for you or? Um, oh gosh, I have so many. So I like to use tapioca in um, a stir fry for two reasons. I like to roll the, the meat in it or the chicken or at least toss it in it. And then I like to, you know, spread it out in the oil individually and kind of get that brown on each side. I feel like tapioca crisps up more than arrowroot flour, but then also when you go to add the sauce, the tapioca does a really good job of thickening it too. I think of it kind of like a cornstarch, mm -hmm. but I think it crisps better than arrowroot. I do like to use arrowroot if I'm like just making a slurry and thickening a sauce. Mm -hmm. um, I use that a lot in recipes. I love cassava flour when I'm thinking more like regular all-purpose flour. Mm -hmm. So like I'll dredge chicken, like I have a creamy skillet chicken Toscana in the book where I dredge the chicken first and then I add kale and potatoes and all the things. And then I pour in some broth and lemon and some seasonings. And then that, the cassava really helps brown the chicken, but it also helps thicken the sauce a little bit too. So I kind of have my little tricks for each one and they are all similar, but when you go work, when you start working with grain-free flowers, they're also really, they're fickle too. So you really have to get familiar with them. And my book's a great introduction to all of the grain free flowers because I really use them all in different ways. I use almond flour more as like a breadcrumb coating right? instead of like a flour flour. It's way more gritty. So I'll usually blend that with tapioca flour. And like, that's what I make like my chicken Parmesan with. If I want like a crunchy chicken that's grain free. Yeah. So I have a lot of like little hacks that I've developed over the years. And I used to not use cassava much in this book. I used it more because I've really started to get comfortable with how I use it in the kitchen. Never for baking, but great for dredging. Awesome. Well, I can go on for days. <laughs> no, it's really good because I think this is, you know, when for me, it's like I'll jump on the New York, New York Times cooking app, for example, and I'll just like, this is fun. I'm just looking at recipes that are popping up and going like, how would I... You pull out the refined flours, lower the sugar, swap a soy for a coconut amino, see if that tastes, and like, sometimes it's great and sometimes it's an absolute fail and my husband's like, nice try. And a lot <laughs> of times it's not having those hacks yes. or understanding because I'm not recipe testing. I'm seeing clients and most of the day or like doing podcasts or whatever. It's, it's knowing in the back of my head, like, how would I use these flours or wh which ones swap best or why yeah. it's. You know, why would that be failing, for example? And then sure. so why baking is like a whole nother science. You and think that I be is a whole nother science. It, but I'm like, yes. oh, geez. no. And I feel like you really have to get a combination of like almond flour and arrowroot or tapioca to make a good flour base for a lot of baking is what I've realized over the years. But in my book, I have a pantry staples and I really kind of outline how I use 
each one of these grain-free flours or dairy-free creamers or whatever con different condiments throughout the book and what they're good for. Like some are more similar to cornstarch and I kind of outlined that, but I think it's important to remember it's never like a one-to-one -one ratio with, like you said, when you go to New York Times and you're like, oh, she said it's like cornstarch. I'll just swap that in for cornstarch this time. Arrowroot can get really gummy and really snotty almost Ew. when you cook with it. And you like, I know, horrible word to use when talking about food. You're like, it's basically but, a loogie, but it's fine. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely awful if you overdo it and it can get the worst texture ever. So it's, again, these flowers are fickle, but once you get familiar with them, they're great. But every now and then you have, I'll be cooking with them and I'm like, that did not go over well. <laughs> yeah, you're like, fail. <laughs> yeah, let's switch a different route. Oh my goodness. Well, a recipe that you talked about that sounds delicious to me is the celery soup. How often are you making sort of like bulk style meals? You mentioned using your freezer. I'd like to know a little bit more about how you personally use your freezer, what you make in bulk, what you store, how you store it, if you want to pull it out for a quick meal. You know, I don't make a lot of stuff in bulk. Okay. Like rarely ever do I do that. Every now and then I'll be like, oh, I'm having people over to watch a football game and I make way too much food. I'll freeze some of that. Yeah. But that's just not. It's not pizzazzy enough for you. Yeah. And I honestly get, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with this too, but I get a lot of food products delivered to me to try. And I'll usually put that kind of stuff in the freezer and be able to kind of rotate that and thaw it out. I, have, I keep a lot of protein in my freezer. A lot of fish. I am subscribed to Fish Fix, which is a great fish subscription service. I use that. That's always in my freezer. My dog's food is in the freezer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe some, I keep a lot of siete tortillas in there because we, we are always eating those throughout the week. And then I'll pull that out. You know, I feel like that's kind of the basics. Pizza crust, if we want some to make some pizza, anything of that nature. And then just random things that I've acquired. <laughs> Got it. So it's really mostly your proteins and you're pulling those out to defrost based on like what you've planned for for the week and maybe some leftovers, yeah. but you're not, you're not necessarily planning ahead because you're so comfortable in the kitchen. Yeah. And I'm just always cooking so much, you know, and it's just like, I don't need to save food. I usually will be like, all right, who wants to take this home today? Because otherwise it's just so much excess. And so I'm, I'm always giving food to my friends and family and anybody that walks through these doors. I'm like, here, take. <laughs> right. Because it's just a lot of recipe, a lot of cooking happening over here. So, all right, you're obviously recipe testing and cooking. And does that ever take a toll on how you feel energetically or like eating and constantly, constantly trying food? And, and how do you I, like, how do you... I don't want to say stay healthy because obviously you're making really, really healthy meals. But I know personally, yeah. like if I do a food shoot day, because I've like created some recipes and I'm like, okay, I'm going to share some of these recipes on Instagram and I do the food shoot and I try the things. At the end of the day, I'm like, gas, I'm so exhausted. And I'm yeah. like, whoa, this was a lot. Was it just because I was like on my feet and cooking and eating? And it's like, I had a yeah. Thanksgiving on a random Tuesday in March. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? You no, know, I think because I do do it for a living and it's all the time not just sporadically that you know we're good about like just having a bite of things and not overeating every little thing that we come up every I'm now and then all I'll, the I'll tacos i made <laughs> yeah every now and then i'll overdo it and i'm just like oh i'm i'm so tired like i ate way too much and then i don't even want dinner with my family that night because i'm just like i just have been eating all day Right. So yeah, I think just because I do it all the time, it's just, I had to develop better habits around all the food, but yeah, cooking that much can get very tiring, but I have kind of a system set up where I'll like, you know, kind of play around with concepts on the weeknight. So that way I'm not like writing them down, trying to figure out what the recipe is really measuring things out. It's more just like, here's some flavors and I, an idea I had, let me get it to a point where I'm ready to develop it and write it out. And I'll do that on the weeknights where it's the fun style of cooking that makes me love cooking so much. And then I'll have like on Tuesdays and Thursdays, my recipe development days where we're like, all right, now we're measuring these ideas that I have gotten to, you know, this point. 
So that helps me not get burnt out. I also think, you know, one thing that I've always set with myself is a very strong intention that I can never not love cooking because aside from the defined dish, aside from everything, like being someone who loves to cook is a huge part of who I am. It always has been. And it is, it would be taking away part of my soul. Like I could cry thinking about not loving to cook anymore. So I think because it is my job, I have to be able to set boundaries with myself and really step back from social media sometimes and just the obligation to just put out recipe all the time and crank out content and really step back and be like, I need a break (laughs) because it just, it can, you'll get creative burnout. And the last thing that I want to do is hate the one thing that I love most in life. I mean, truly. So it's so important. So many times as moms and entrepreneurs and women, we say yes all the time. And we're constantly Mm -hmm. trying to people please or like take care of everyone else or like meet everyone else's expectations. I'm curious, like, I love that you're taking a, hitting a pause sometimes on social media. When we look kind of under the hood or into your business, how do you have, how do you work your business? I know you mentioned you recipe test on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Do you have a team that supports you? Like how often are you actually requiring yourself to like be online and how are you keeping those boundaries for your family? Yeah, I feel like as far as like my Instagram goes, that's really my biggest social platform. It's always me that's on there. If if I am on there, I respond to the DMs. I don't get to all of them. I get to as many as possible. I just felt like I'd rather be me half the time than somebody else all the time and Same. just responding like they're me because it is me communicating with them through Instagram stories. So to have someone else respond, that's not me, just didn't feel authentic to me. So I, that's always me. I have Katie on my team who is my operations manager. She is really my right-hand woman as far as just day-to-day operations go and to keep up with the emails and all the things, <laughs> all the technical sides of things and just organizing me as a whole. I'm more of a creative type. So she's been a huge part. She's really my only like paid employee. I have a manager that I have been with for a while. She's in LA and she handles like all of my brand partnership deals and negotiations. And then I outsource a lot of some of my, the ways that my blog works. Like I outsource like a video person where I'll send them the recipe and I'm like, Hey, will you create a video out of this recipe? I have a girl, she lives in Portland, Oregon. She does all of my video work. And then I have a girl where I'll make, I used to take all my own photographs. I still sometimes do, but starting in October, I started to outsource my food photography and I basically will get my recipes to, to where they're developed and I'll take a picture with my phone and I'll put them in a folder and I'm like, okay, now shoot this. I'd like it to be in like, soft air or like like a nice light airy photo or this or that with this feel cozy you know I'll give kind of like some tips and she photographs all my recipes so I outsource things like that that's so wonderful that helps me be able to focus on my talent and how I built this is being a recipe creator and all the other elements of the business can cloud that to where you don't even have time to do that anymore so it's really important to have um, a team in place and hire out people to be able to stay sustainable and do what you do. So that's how we operate right now. It's always ever changing. And, but that's more or less the defined dish team. (laughs) I love it. I I know it's just important. I think for other entrepreneurs, because in the beginning, you don't have the flexibility or the success to outsource everything you have to. I don't want to say hustle because I hate, Hey, you got to hustle, but like you, you put in, you have to be all the hats. Right. Like you're, sure. you're answering your emails, you're, you know, doing yep. the recipe testing, you're shooting it, you're doing all of it. And it is interesting that you have taken a step back and decided like what you really like to do and protected that. Like yeah. that your family gets these amazing recipes that you've developed and you still love to cook and you don't have to get bogged down with like, did I set this up right on the table and is my lighting right? Yeah. (laughs) You know, and And, and it it destroys the family dinner time because I'm like, hold on, we gotta, I gotta shoot this photo first. And that's what, when I started to find dish, what it was, I mean, it was literally me with a light box at dinner time being like, hold on, don't eat your food yet. I gotta take a photo first. And it has evolved so much over the years. And I've, I've realized that outsourcing is so important, but you're right. I mean, there was a time and place where I did 
I was literally wore every single hat and I'm, I'm glad I'm not there anymore because I don't think I could do it. But I think it's also important. What I've realized too, is just, you know, there is so many different elements of the business side of things. And not only do I feel out of alignment with myself whenever I'm not truly enjoying the recipe creation process, but my community has grown with me so much and they're so supportive of me. And like, I want them to see that I still love to do what I do because if they know that I'm miserable, like why, why would they want me to be miserable? Like they, they love me and like, they want me to be happy. And I think it's really important to create those boundaries for myself so that the love and of, of cooking and food still shines through what I do at the end of the day, because that's what everyone's gathered around at the Defined Dish Force, because we all love food and it's built this wonderful community. And I'm kind of like the mayor of this community. And I want to make sure I lead by a healthy example that um, I'm enjoying the process too. So that's super important to me. <laughs> you do have a really amazing community. It's fun to watch just the comments roll in and the people that cheer and support you. So I'm curious, how has the tour been? It's been so wonderful. I am finished. Yeah. <laughs> it was Yay! crazy. It was so crazy, but every minute of it, I loved. We did a lot of cities this time and we were supposed to kind of space them out between January and February, but for COVID reasons, it was all crammed into the little month of February. Mm -hmm. So we hit up like 15 cities in 28 days and it was pretty wild. It was pretty wow. wild, but it was so much fun too. And I love, you know, it's like you only get that opportunity in the cookbook world that, you know, approximately takes two years to create a book and do the whole thing to really sit down with your community every two years. So it's, it's my family's always like, this is so hard. And I had to remind like my oldest daughter, cause she's older this time. And she's gets really sensitive. I lead. I'm like, mommy works really hard, you know, to do what she does. And like, I'm home all the time, but there's one month every two years, hopefully we'll continue to the bit where, where mommy has to do this. Like, this is important, not only for my business, but for me, because I get to see the people behind the defined dish and it just lights lights me up and makes me want to go home and keep doing it, you know, to see people in person and not on a screen. So right. rejuvenating and it re-inspires you to get back in there. For sure. So yeah. how are you staying? I love it. In your community is amazing. And it's like, I, I feel the same way in a different way. I'm not creating those recipes, but just if you've helped anyone in any way and recipes help everyone because you have people cooking in their home kitchen more often, they're feeling better. They're more energized. They have less depression, anxiety, pain, mm. like problems. Like it's pretty amazing what just cooking at home can do for people. And so making it accessible and like keeping it interesting and your pizzazz is so, so important because I think that's a, that's the burnout, like you get sick mm. of cooking and what you cook is boring. And so you're over it. So how do you stay inspired? Like, I mean, I mentioned the New York times cooking app because that's sometimes Pinterest. I'm like, whoa. Mm -mm. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot no, going on. <laughs> I just need like, I just need a couple of recipes that I can peruse in a very minimal kind of way. But what keeps you inspired? Where do you get your inspiration? Who are your favorite follows? Like what? Yeah. Where, where are you getting oh, man. excited? I feel like food is like art. It's just inspiration is everywhere. I feel like whether you are walking into the grocery store and for whatever reason, the apples are looking really good today. Like how can you cook with them? Yeah. That's one way. It's just like literally walking into the grocery store. I feel like ingredients are always just popping out at me or, you know, walking through the pantry aisle and seeing a really fun new condiment. And it's like, Ooh, I would love to cook with that tonight. So there's that element of seasonal things and just walking to the grocery store and seeing what looks good. Travel, I feel like is travel and restaurants are super inspiring for me in developing new flavor profiles and like understanding like some other palettes that I like wouldn't have ever put together. So I really, I love dining out and I love traveling for that reason. And I'm like, where can we eat? That's just like totally unique, something that we've never had before. And so I feel like travel and grocery store are probably my top two. And then aside from that, of course, like I have so many amazing, I think there's so many amazing creators that I love to follow and get inspired by and just get entertained by as well. I feel like a lot of them are on my, if you go on my story highlights, my past the dish, I do a series where I invite like a food creator to share a recipe with my audience once a month. 
And I've been doing that for about two years now. And I have them all saved, each person. And those are really some of the cute. people that inspire, inspire me the most. But I'd say probably my favorite follow on Instagram is Ronnie Joseph of Primal Gourmet. Do you follow him? No. Oh, he's so fantastic. Such a fun follow. He's he's always been my longtime fave. So all right, but, I'm gonna go give him a file. I'm gonna go give him a follow. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, he's fantastic. So much fun. I think he needs his own cooking show. He's really fun to watch. Okay, cool. Well, I already have so many just I feel inspired. And I feel confident <laughs> and I'm so excited about your book. And thank I just want to thank you for being here and congratulate you on your new book, The Comfortable Kitchen. I'm glad you're home and you can uh, get back to you. creating. I know. Oh, I know. I'm, I'm back in my home. Home body. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, where can people follow along and, and where can they snag the book? Yes. So the book, I have two books. The first one's The Defined Dish. The second one's The Comfortable Kitchen. And both are available where books are sold for the most part. So you can find it online. You can go to Barnes & Noble, your local bookstore, and they should be there, hopefully. And then on social media, I'm The Defined Dish. Everywhere my blog is thedefinedish.com. So it's pretty easy to find me. I'm <laughs> heading to those five ingredient meals right now. Yes. Yes. They're we'll on the top. A, we'll, we'll, put, we'll put a link to the show notes. Thanks, Alex. This for was sure. really fun. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to Be Well by Kelly. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more at bewellbykelly.com and follow me on Instagram at bewellbykelly. I would love if you picked up my books, Body Love and Body Love Every Day. They're sold on Amazon and at all major booksellers. 